Summit 2019. It's day two, and I'm here with our first speaker of the day, Daniel Stickler. I heard that in your speech, somebody asked if we would be stuck on an island and there would be nothing else, what should you eat? But I'm not going to get you to give the answer now, <laughs> because if you want to know that, tune into the live stream and get it. But I wanted to ask you about peptides. Okay. You were talking about them today. Why are they uh, important for us? What are they? Where do they come from? Well, peptides, it's a whole new realm of what we call biologics in, in health and wellness. And peptides are derived from human proteins. Some of them are identical sequences to the peptides that our body makes. Some of them are pieces of proteins that the body makes. But the great thing about them is they're very on target, very specific with what they do because the body's familiar with them. That's the safety aspect of it too. The body knows what this is and it knows what to do with it and it knows if there's too much of it or too little of it, how to respond to that. So there's a nice safety profile with the peptides. I just really see the peptides and other biologics as the body kind of responds to them instead of reacts to them. Medications, the tend, body tends to react. Supplements, the body tends to react. And you also have a lot of off-target effects. So you're trying to achieve X, but you get X, Y, and Z with off-target effects. With the peptides, typically when you want to achieve X, you get X, and you don't get Y and Z. Okay, that's really interesting. I also wanted to start the conversation. So if peptides are kind of this key to good health, uh, do you think that big pharmaceutical companies are going to try to buy up the smaller companies that make them, and what would be a solution to sort of making them sustainable, long-term and available to all of humanity in a way. Well, the interesting thing about peptides right now is you can go online and purchase peptides anywhere in the world. You can, there's sequencers, they're not expensive devices to have. Yes. I mean, these are something that people can sequence pretty, pretty regularly. What we're seeing with the pharmaceutical companies is they're, they're getting a little bit afraid of the peptides. So they're trying to figure out what they can do. So what they're doing is they're taking the peptides and trying to mod them. So they modify them in some way that allows them to patent the peptide. Okay. So they make it better than what the straight peptide does. Okay. Uh, we're seeing that with Dihexa right now. Dihexa was developed out of the University of Washington, but Dihexa itself can't be patented necessarily. So you see a lot of companies that are making Dihexa, but a pharmaceutical company is trying to modify Dihexa to get it in clinical trials and get the modified version through a clinical trial that they can then patent and sell. It's sort of nature's way of giving it up to the yeah. big industries that yeah. we've got this. I wanted to ask you a couple of questions from our live stream audience. Okay. Someone asks, how do epigenetics work in a nutshell? Uh, in a nutshell, epigenetics are, so our DNA code is the hardware of the computer. Epigenetics is the software. This is what we actually have control over. We can change gene expressions with every input to the human system. And this is what I look at is everything that goes into this system is an input. I don't judge things as, oh, this is natural, this is synthetic, whatever it is. I look at, here's an input, here's what it does in the system, here are the side effects, here's the results. And I say, what is going to be the best thing to use to get that outcome that I want to get with minimal side effects? So. Essentially, um, I kind of lost track of what the question was. Yeah, just about what is epigenetics. Oh, the epigenetics, so sort of our right. software. Yeah, so in epigenetics, the body is constantly adapting to changes in environment, whether it's a change in the weather that we go through, it's a change in an exercise pattern, it's a change in a dietary pattern. Our genes are constantly assessing every aspect of that the human biosphere that we live in and saying, what do I need to change to be optimized in this environment? So if you start exercising regularly, the body says, whoa, this is an unfamiliar environment, and will adapt by changing gene expressions to create 
an adaptive response. With chronic exercise, we see as many as 7,000 genes changing expression. It's wow. a third of our genome. Wow. And one more question. What do you consider most promising use of epigenetics in curing the diseases mentioned, for example, depression, ADHD? Those are the big you know, ones. that's a tough one because uh, right now we haven't identified the epigenetic patterns of these. Now, it's interesting because I just saw a study where they actually identified an epigenetic pattern, a methylation mark on the DNA that was specific for PTSD. Uh, so they're actually looking at ways that they can affect that. Um, I, you know, epigenetics is so difficult to, to pin down to say, I want to change this because every, every cell type in our body has a different epigenome. So the, the epigenome is what actually controls gene expression. It's what makes a, a cell here a skin cell versus a cell here a, a retinal cell. They have the same genetic code in both cells, but the epigenome has controlled what's turned on and what's turned off. So trying to specifically target, say, a brain, a, a nerve cell, or a specific type of nerve cell, let's say a serotonergic nerve cell, is going to have a ep different epigenetic pattern than a, um, than a GABA-producing nerve cell. And so you've got to look at what you're trying to target specifically. So I don't think targeting an individual medical change in the epigenome is going to be that effective, but targeting a lifestyle that globally affects a gene expression is probably the way to go. Do you have some prediction of how long it would be before we actually see like the population being affected by this? Because right now it's a small percentage of people, I think, who are even in tune with these kind of topics. Well, we're just now getting, getting good at measuring. Yes gene expression and epigenome. Um, we, in our clinical practice, we do epigenetic age or we do chronomics tests for uh, gene age or methyl epigenetic age. So we're actually looking at epigenetic marks and there was a study that just came out uh, about a month ago where they actually showed age reversal by epigenetic age. This was wow. a study by uh, Dr. Fahey and Horvath. Um, it's a small study of nine people, but it's the first time we've actually seen that epigenetic age could be reversed. Wow. And so it's, it's that, getting exciting. That's going to be big. <laughs> What's your latest finding from your own data that you were excited about? <laughs> uh, I'm getting my VO2 max up. Um, okay. So my VO2 max has been increasing lately um, through a combination of changing my workouts a little bit, but also um, supplementing with a... Um, a research chemical called GW501516, which is also called carterine. Uh, one of the effects of it is to boost VO2 max, and I've actually seen that happening. We have some companies here today, Garmin, Fenix, Aura. Do you use any of them? Yeah, uh, and all the wearable technology. So I work with all of it because my clients have very specific, uh, you know, everybody likes their, their particular For brand sure. of what they're using. Some people won't wear a watch. My preference is to go with the Garmin because the data is just so prolific that we can, I mean, it's just a huge amount of data that we can gather from the Garmin's. Of course. But um, Aura Ring, very good. Biostrap is very good. Um, a lot of good devices. You just have to use them dynamically. A lot of people go in and they think, oh, well, this number means something by itself. It doesn't. What it means is that's the baseline. And what you do to affect that baseline is what's important. So you monitor over time things that change that baseline. So we collect so much data. Is there some specific improvement apart from traveling less, which is not, traveling's not a very natural thing, obviously, for the body to do. Is there some other specific improvement you've taken or that you can recommend to our viewers? Well, there's, um, I've been working with a supplement called DHHB, which is a honokaiol. It's an extract of magnolia bark, but the concentrated version of it is very good with uh, stress reduction. And one of the biggest things I've noticed is when I travel, I have great elevations in my stress levels. Of course. Uh, I don't feel it, I don't cognitively have it, but even when I sleep on a plane, my stress levels are high. Okay. Doesn't matter if it's daytime or night, so I've looked at that too. Uh, so right now I've, I'm trying 
DHHB and seeing what that does to my stress levels when I travel. Okay. That would be interesting to see how it goes because people are traveling. Oh yeah, I mean it's days. a big deal for a lot of people. Yeah, and if people would like to know more about you and the work that you do, what's the best place for them to look online? Uh, best place to go is to appear on Zoe. That's A P E I R O N Z O H dot com. That gives an overview of all the different aspects of what we do. So we have a we have a training academy where we teach epigenetics. It's about 80 hours of online training. We have a peptide course, um, and we have a medical center. We also have a genetic company where we do genetic testing. So wow. We've got quite a bit of stuff. Thank you, Daniel Stickler, for being with us here today at the Biohacker Summit 2019. You can follow our live stream or join our YouTube channel for more interviews like this one. Thank, Thank you. you very much.